Um, yeah, I just wanted to start by thanking everyone at Karma for having me here. It's really a really great pleasure to be back in LA. And, um, and of course, thanks to everyone for being here. I know it's Friday afternoon in Los Angeles. It's not an easy time to get around, so appreciate it. But we are here for Sana, and we're really grateful that you are here from all the way from Kampala with this really beautiful show. And it's a great um, opportunity and great honor to be in conversation with you. It's been an ongoing dialogue that we have, and it's really great yeah. to, yeah. to continue. Yes, I'm very happy to be here. And um, <clears throat> first of all, karma to have made it possible, as well as meeting you again after so many years. Oh, yes. I first met Saurabh in Kampala uh, when he visited me in the studio. And he was with the team, a group of people. And, and out of that meeting came an exhibition in Pittsburgh. Right. Uh, where you were curating the, and then came to karma uh, i think <laughs> good karma a, yeah it's a good <laughs> karma <laughs> so here i am yeah. and nice to meet you yeah. again okay. yeah really nice so just yeah. to set the stage um i was in kampala we were doing research for the carnegie international and we were um had a last morning in Kampala, and we stopped by Sana's um, studio. And I would say we, I walked into the studio and already knew that we, you know, we have to work together. Obviously, I didn't say it then and there, no, but, I, I, but I, I, um, walking in, and there were works rem reminiscent of it, but it's a different body of work. It was like looking at uh, flowers, but also its relationship with certain kind of uh, vernacular architecture back mm -hmm. then. So that was a big series of works there. And in the back, um, just to give you a, a picture of the studio, there were jars and jars and jars of beads. So as you know, as you can see, there are a lot of beads here. But before we get to this, I thought it would be really great to kind of go back to uh, when you started. Um, there was a few kind of really interesting um, aspects of, of Sana's practice that we see here, but also I think it's good to talk about some of the history. So to begin with, I was hoping maybe you can talk a little bit, a little bit about Kizoro, um, where mm -hmm. you were growing up there, and I, kind of about the um, creative community there, because mm -hmm. um, in the past we've talked about that, so just hoping to, if you don't mind, start from there. Thank you, thank you. Um, the creative community, uh, has been the backbone of my work uh, because um, when one grows up, there is a reflection to your past. And when I look at my past as an artist who didn't really uh, go to school, proper art school, um, I find that uh, my childhood in Kisoro, south of Uganda, which used to be Rwanda, um, I speak Rwandese, and I'm Rwandese in the sense, but uh, the borders were divided, and you know, in Africa, we, we have borders that cut through groups of people uh, of the same language, of the same culture. So I happen to have two cultures, Ugandan and Rwandese. So I met my mother would say, could you please take the knife to the metal worker? We need new knives or something. I was about five or four, I think. And uh, there would be with the bellows and looking at people making uh, implements. And then I would, um, the potters, our neighbors were a group of potters and they would be making pots because everybody um, used pots to cook. There are no shops. I never saw shops. I never had sugar until when I was about seven. And it was quite a, a, a coincidence, quite a, a thing, you know. So I won't go into that, but um, so we were very rural, but we had all the necessities to make life, the pots, the knives, the the, the, the carvers, the gourds, and all that. Uh, and this is the backbone 
of our lives in Africa. And if we cared enough, it's the school. That's my school. Right. Yeah. yeah. You think of that as your... Uh, yeah, yeah. School. I think I respect and think that is where I get all this uh, amazing uh, uh, stimulus. Right. Because, uh, yeah. And this exhibition is called Nourishment. Right. So I'm really nourished, nourished by, by that. that. Right. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. this is kind of a side question, but uh, it seems like you're coming from a very creative uh, family or... Um, your sister is also a writer, as far as I know. Mm. And is that something that was also in the family, or in general, you feel it was? Well, uh, my family um, originally, grandparents were medicine people, people who treated other people yeah. with herbs and barks. And um, then we had a musician uh, among the family, um, which is not so fantastic in the village because people, ceremonies, mm -hmm. people will take part and sing, talent will be discovered and people will continue with that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose my family is very creative. Uh, my grandchildren are oh, very well. creative, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after that, you go to um, Camden Arts, uh, to Camden yeah. uh, College of the Art. Um, I believe via Florence. Um, yes, yes. And yes. that's a very kind of um, important period for you, as I understand, both being in yeah. London at that time. Um, would you talk about that a little bit? Like why did you go from Florence to, to London, London and mm -hmm. what came about in London that for you was... Um... I'll talk a little bit about the reasons behind my going to Europe, right? Because, um, um, by the way, I'd like to introduce this gentleman, um, <laughs> Holland Millis, who f figures in my, you know, we met in the 1970s in Mombasa. And I happened to have gone to Mombasa during the Idi Amin period of time in Uganda, which was a very difficult time. But I was a, uh, reason I went there was that uh, I'd been working with the Minister of Culture and Community Development in Uganda, which actually influenced my visibility of the makers of things even further than my childhood. Right. So going there, uh, I started a gallery out of the blue, uh, the age of 21, I think. Uh, and then uh, uh, I meet Holland. Holland was a Peace Corps volunteer. He, he was heading uh, a disabled group of people, and they were making jewelry out of copper. Oh, okay. So my interest, of course, comes back to metal work. Okay, right. But also, um, I had a variety of things and, uh, that I was putting in the gallery. Um, Mombasa is a multicultural group of city type, you know, you get uh, art from the Asian, uh, you get from um, the Arab and mm -hmm. uh, the Indian and the Congolese and all over, really, because even the Chinese ships that used to come in the 17th century, and some sunk there, and their, their contents float on the beaches of mm -hmm of Lamu, for example, and I would go to Lamu Island to buy these ginger jars. I had no idea that the, there was a ship that had sunk, and I had to investigate. The museum found out that uh, these things were floating off on the beach because of this ship. Oh, that had, ship right. Yeah, so, so my, my gallery was uh, a blend of all these uh, cultures that eventually compelled me to want to learn what, how to use these things, mm -hmm. the art of people that use these items. So uh, reading about art history, trying to be, go back to school in the sense uh, I went to corresponding school in London. I would 
be corresponding up and down. And I would be reading about art history. I'd be reading about Italy and the early masters, the Renaissance, and, and it fascinated me. And of course, um, I could see that I wouldn't make headway unless I became a professional artist that I wanted to be. Right, right. And one way to do it, because I was going to pay for my school, was to sell my business and then go for the interior design or jewelry design or that would get me into the art because the art was rather expensive, I thought. So I thought that I should go to Italy. It's warmer, I thought. Um, and uh, the, from what I read, um, there was an affinity, there, there was this Africanness about Italy that I felt. Okay, I arrived in Florence with my family and uh, two kids and a wife and myself, and, and uh, life was not easy. Um, so somehow they go to London, I remain in Italy, and I experience this Italian lifestyle. I become a jeweler because I found, I, being a jeweler, I could work in the night and mm -hmm. sell my new creations in the markets to pay my college, you know. And so, and it worked for a while, but I had to join my family. So I moved on to London. And this would be around early 70s? Or this was uh, 72. 80. Oh. Uh, yeah, I had my studio, my, my gallery from 71 okay. to 78. Okay. Yeah, so after that is when I did the correspondence and then moved to Europe in 82. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I moved to Europe. I started to do night classes. In uh, London? In London, right. yeah. Um, we had a home and my children were going to school and, and uh, you know, so... Uh, doing night classes, I would work for a jeweler in the day. If you know London, there's a jewelry area called Hutton Garden, and uh, there's um, there are many jewelers there, and I would be working in the day and night time. I'd be working um, in the classroom. And then, of course, uh, in Africa, we don't waste so much paper uh, but there was a lot of paper coming through the, w the door. Um, right. There's a lot of paper, actually, in developed countries at that time. I, I can see the telephone and the computers taking over much public, you know, publications. But uh, in the 80s, the council diary or newspaper, the advertising, all these things were coming through our door. And I would um, be fascinated by the quality of paper, the colors, the information. Um, meanwhile, I was um, toying around doing art using paper because this is material, free, um, and wonderful colors. I didn't have to buy colors. <laughs> so, so, so with the scissors, you would cut up things, and I got the the idea of using um, the core um, toilet roll, the, the inner uh, piece, which if you opened carefully, it's a triangle. It's, a, it's a, an obtuse triangle. It's sort mm -hmm. of like one side straight. And the core. The yeah. core, yeah, you open it up. And, and then I started to play around with it, you know, gluing it on the board. And, and um, I took it to my college, Camden College, and um, the lecturer said, ah, this, because I had rolled some of the paper. And she says, yeah, well, um, there was a period after the Second World War, during the war, when Europe, people didn't have materials enough, metal, uh, because most of it was going to war, war, war whatever. And uh, they were using paper to make jewelry. 
And lucky enough, I found a bead in the rubbish bin of the school, of the college. And it was a paper bead, which I took home and carefully opened up. And it was a triangle, a perfect triangle, an equilateral triangle. And that's the beginning of my paper making, uh, bead making. Yeah. So then when you're working there, you start making work with the bead already? Because um, um, Yeah, in, there was in a, yes, in London, I had to, as I told you, um, I was working for jewelers, but sure. also at the weekend and free time, I would go to markets. So the, the paper beads that I made, having learned about the technique of casting, or I would cast them in silver, you take a paper bead and get to a jeweler and cast it in silver and uh, gild it, if you wish, to make it golden. And that would make a good sell of that, as earrings and necklaces. Um, and it was during a time in, in, in England, or London, where there was the black art movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when the black art movement is happening, and you kind of... I, I found it uh, a very wonderful school of thought. Um, mm -hmm. People, political, social, and um, creative. Because the black art movement was, uh, um, London was very cosmopolitan. Um, you could find Caribbean people, people from Africa all around. Uh, we even had uh, people from India, we had, even the Irish were in, in part of this movement because the minorities, the minority community joined into this pot of mm -hmm. artists and we showed artworks in different places. So it really stimulated my making uh, of jewelry. Um, at that time I was showing jewelry more than art. Uh, I started painting on bark cloth I got backcloth from Uganda, and, and gradually I uh, started to exhibit mm -hmm. um, backcloth. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk about the significance of backcloth? I was like interesting that you brought that from Uganda and started yeah. working on it. But it, I, as, as I understand, it has a lot of um, cultural significance as well. So it's a yeah. it's a very different <laughs> yes, from yes. your regular canvas. Backcloth, by the way, is. Uh, is a fantastic material. Well, I'm not taxing, I just want to look uh, at my questions. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing material because it's um, traditionally was used for many things, um, for wearing, for bedding, because it's anti-mosquito. Um, however old it may be, you will iron it or warm it and it will have a scent, a very lovely scent. And this scent repels mosquitoes and other insects. Um, it is primarily used to embalm, to bury people, uh, because it has a property of drying up the dead into, you can transport somebody after 10 years of burial, and you can oh, bury them. Buried. Yeah, because we have the tradition of burial grounds. So if, uh, I happen to die here. Sohara will take me to, <laughs> after 10 years, <laughs> to Uganda and uh, in a bar cloth. Right. You know, you bury me in a bar cloth and, and then later take me to this, my burial ground, uh, which um, is, is quite good. But bar cloth um, is still being used. It's made from a thicker tree. Um, it is. Um, not as popular as it was, because uh, for religious reasons, it was used uh, as screens uh, in the interiors of the houses, but also in shrines. And so the shrine being a religious um, place mm -hmm. uh, came against Christianity. And Christianity really condemned the back cloth because it was related to to, to spiritual uh, worship or to 
well, it, it's, it's a political like a party. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's like a political. So um, people now, you know, some people will not even want to touch buckcloth because it's for the dead or for the for the for satanic reasons. I don't know why. <laughs> right. uh, Christianity did a lot of harm to culture and cultural practice. Um, so sometimes I would go with my piece of bar cloth. Um, after buying a piece of bar cloth, I didn't want it wrapped. And people in the taxi, if I'm sitting in a taxi, people would say, oh, I'm so sorry, you lost someone. And yes, that's fine, because they think I'm going to bury someone. But others would say, oh, I don't want to sit next to this man, because He's got this bar device cloth. piece of cloth. Yeah. So hence the production went down. The trees uh. went down. Um, very few trees. We are currently trying to find, uh, replant mm. uh, this ficus tree. Oh, okay. And the bark cloth, by the way, does not affect the tree at all. When you remove the skin of the tree, you wrap, bandage it up with them. Um, banana leaves, mm. and it recreates another skin. After three years, you can take that skin again and make a cloth and f until four times. Then you leave the tree to live. So it's really amazing. If you have a 20 trees in the garden, uh, yeah, you, 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 fine. You know. Do you have like trees in your property where you have your studio as well? Uh, where you found me, no. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I, I have in my village, I have trees. Okay. Yeah, I have trees. So yeah. at first you were making paintings using the bar cloth. Is that mm. where, um, I believe there was the New Horizons show in 1985. And in that moment you were using the bar cloth, making paintings, and then yes. later the beads become kind of the second yeah. layer on the bar cloth, on the bar cloth. Right. Yeah, well, uh, London was um, not so fantastic the more you progressed, mm. because politically, as I told you, I was aware of the need to go home mm -hmm. and participate in the, right. in the, in the, in the life of, of uh, I was missing um, certain things value things like community, um, the communities in Africa and so forth. And so I wanted to go home and I wanted to go and have the beads made by community because right. you can't sit down and make so many beads yourself. Um, you have to employ people. And uh, so while the New Horizon exhibition was happening, um, it was, in a way, sending messages. You've got to actually be an artist from home rather than London. So it was a wonderful time to show in London at the Royal Festival Hall a group of about 20 artists or less. Um, some of them extremely successful artists today. Um, and I was, or, yeah, um, people like Sokari Douglas, right. uh, Ham, Hamid, Zubaid Hamid, right. and others, you know. And I'm, I was showing jewelry, mm. uh, but also a bit of bark cloth, um, and uh, it stimulated my going back. Okay. Yeah. So you go back after the AD, I mean. I go period. there. Um, with the current president who is there now. Right. So I left London in 90. Um, 1990. In 1989, really, but I started off in 1990. It's when I arrived in Uganda, and uh, mm -hmm. I find that the wars had displaced very many people. My family had moved to the village uh, where I moved to, and opened a studio and started the paper mm. bead making. The magazines, of course, They're coming in. were very few, mm -hmm. but there was a, a bit, an influx of Chinese magazine in Chinese language, which people simply used to, to sell granites, to wrap up 
things to pin up pictures in their houses or whatever they use them for. But I found them fantastic, colorful, very good paper. So they were perfect for bead making. Mm -hmm. So I uh, started to make Sorry, beads. Yeah. So the bead is a, a very fascinating idea mm -hmm. because it's this one very small unit that yeah. through which not only obviously you create your work, but you create a com community. It's like it, it creates a certain cosmology around the work, but all is constructed around this one small unit. Yeah. And it, you know, also connects to uh, the papers that are coming in. There's so much, um, there's so much, they're, they're so expansive. Yeah, this yeah. One yeah, unit. yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's where you came with what you call the unit construction theory. Yes, yes, um, yes. Do yeah, you yeah, want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah. If you look at the bead, it's a, it's a sculpture. It's a little sculpture that can expand. I mean, I can make one bead as big as this. But also, within the bead is information. There's color, there's information. Uh, it's like a talisman. You can wear it as, a, as information. I mean, I fancy that I could be commissioned to make beads out of love letters. Mm. somebody to wear their whole sort of beautiful jewelry out of their love letters. Uh, but also um, because you're taking a complete unit and you're adding it to the other, right. you're constructing mm. a whole thing. So that's how I come up with the unit construction mm -hmm. idea that it is very expansive. And you will see in the work that some of the beads are made in little units like leaves, mm -hmm. uh, stars, um, and then I'm in, you know, playing around with right. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really amazing in Sana's house, you have all these different jars of different colors. It's almost like all the different pigments that, that he would have, but they're all yeah. jars of beads. It's really yeah. amazing to yeah. see that uh, yeah. and all the different colors that you sort and then I guess you use when you're yeah. starting to make the work. But um, the bead also relates to something uh, that you've been working on for also a longer period, which the idea of a dot. Um, okay, yes. And <laughs> can you talk about the dot? And um, <laughs> the, dot the dot idea um, is that um, when you're working with canvas and you're an artist, you have a blank canvas. And so you want to start. And sometimes without sketching, sometimes I like to really go for the work yes. directly onto the. And so what do you do? Um, you make a dot yes. <laughs> on the canvas to try and find solution to what you want to do. Um, so the idea of a dot um, is this um, uh, release of uh, mm -hmm. uh, what this, uh, the word is, escapes me. Because you see, you're, you, you want to start, and then you, you sort of... Um, it's like a yeah, kind of Yeah, with, with, Okay, with the art, sketching is very, very good because you can rub out things. And, but when you're directly working, and you, the moment you start, it's like driving a car. All right. You switch on the engine. You gotta and, go. And then you gotta go. <laughs> so when you put a dot on, <laughs> then you gotta go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, that was uh, my, you know, the dot was, the other way of doing art, whereby you're dealing with the compass. And yeah, yeah. And you wrote that poem. Yeah. The dark yeah. poem, which I have here. Do you want to read it? Uh, God, yes. Or do you want uh, me to read it? I think please it's better read if you it. read it. Yeah, somebody could read it for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the, the poem goes as, um, and I think a lot of kind of ideas are captured in this poem. Yeah. Um, I'm not a greatest reader, but bear with me. And um, so a dot is a dot is a dot. Is the mother of yours, your friend in need, a question mark? Yeah. A dot is a dot is a dot. 
There's your face dotted over the globe, one spot to another. Saying more than you know, growing in fields of dots. A dot is a dot is a dot, alone on a canvas, quite insignificant. A start, a birth, a speck on a landscape, an elephant on the horizon, growing with anticipation of an encounter. A dot is a dot is a dot, likely to burst into millions of dots. Black, red, green, blue, yellow, and gold, so far and yet close. A raindrop rolling off a leaf and swallowed by hungry earth. A dot is a dot is your village, a community, a voice in the hills, a cell of a life, a force of light to keep the fire burning. So this is kind of the captures your <laughs> yeah yeah I'm amazed I'm amazed that you still have I had forgotten all about this <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, um, yeah yeah so to kind of um, get to here mm. can you talk about this nourishment series which um, you're showing here there's all the works here are pretty much 2023 yeah. so this is a kind of new series that you've been working on. Yeah. It's um, the first series that you made after the pandemic. Um, yeah. So would you mind talking a little bit about what we're seeing here? And then um, we can also open uh, if there's any yeah. questions. From the um, I suppose nourishment to me is um, s both spiritual as well as um, physical uh, that you, we all need to, to nourish ourselves. This, this work, body of work, is dealing with areas of uh, nourishment, like say, this work here on your left is about children um, or nature, learning from nature. Nature is our best teacher. And so when you have children or anybody, we are all children, by the way, uh, I don't, have a problem. I'm not young, but I'm still a child. Um, um, <laughs> so we are learning from nature. Um, the arise, that one there, it's called arise. It is rising from within us. We should rise up to challenges, to um, a better life. We, you know, to changes. Yeah, and so. Um, nourishment is the, the um, granary here. This is a granary whereby food is key and is kept and is preserved. That's the granary. And here is about nature. It's looking at nature, um, the forces of nature, the wind blowing and the earth and so forth. And so nourishment is about mm -hmm. ourselves in relation to nature, sustaining, right. sustainability, and so on, yeah. And you know, through the work of making beads, obviously you create a lot of, yeah. um, you know, opportunities for people in community and create, you know, yeah. possibilities for labor, for work, yeah, to yes, yeah. another form of sustenance, another yeah, form of yeah. nourishment that starts there. When you make these works, is there a, initially on the bar cloth, do you have a, um, do you, do you start with a sketch, or and then you develop it and construct the, the um, paintings? Ideas. I tend to like to to, to sketch first of right. all on, directly on. The, I use um, um, chalk mm -hmm. on bar cloth because I can rub it with a brush of water and just clean it up. But also um, uh, when I sketch there's a lot of changes going on. Um, I have a studio like I'm here, and the other side of the studio is a group of women, about seven or eight, and they're all sitting, following the sketches that I'm making. While I make the sketch, I have these bottles of beads in the other room, which are my palette, and I have to see which colors will fit what, right. you know, the composition. Sometimes the construction idea is very good. You throw things on the ground and you work out. It's like music. I play with music. I work with music. It's, a, it's like a dance. It's a, it's a, 
What think, kind of music you usually listen to in the studio? <laughs> oh, um, I enjoy music uh, from Senegal. You know, traditional music is very, very important. Uh, music with rhythm, okay. uh, any music, but or piano, uh, you know, yeah. But uh, anyway, um, depending on what's depending going on. Depending on the uh, mood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I, the the unit making of the beads is made in the village by about twenty women. Uh, they will roll the beads, and then after rolling the beads then another group will treat the beads with the glue uh, and the varnish and also dye them the colors I need because some paper is dull. Some paper is just office paper, which is very good for white uh, or for whatever color, but also it can pick pigment and get your greens, your predominant colors. And then, um, yeah, then right. you store them and then you create, yeah. yeah. Well, um, before opening up, I just wanted to point out to another work that is back there. It's kind of a blue abstract with um, white stripes in, the, in that gallery. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it's an interesting work because that is, um, especially going into another election year in, in these United States. That um, those are the kind of leftovers of the Obama campaign, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just before they were shredded and uh, thrown away or were recycled, I don't know what they do with them yeah. in Chicago. But a friend of mine said, "Oh, there's a lot of paper here." Um, <laughs> so we shipped the paper. Oh, to so Campania. they came from here. Right? Yeah, they came from America. Yeah, yeah, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I am at the moment. <laughs> uh, and um, they sort of half, almost half a ton. And um, very good paper. <laughs> it's, it's the quality, it's, it's, uh, the colors, um, and so a bit heavy. Um, and you know, political campaigns always have these very good colors. You know, at home we have blues, yellows, reds, green, and so this paper is very, because I have a lot, I have, I make series of works under the theme of change, uh, as his campaign was originally, and, uh, and there we are, and I have them, yeah, I, I love them, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's a great, um, statue of um, Obama family right mm. by the lake near the airport in Kampala, where you have the oh, only yes. mm. um, African um, um, liberation uh, yes. leaders. Yes. You have the sculpture of all of them, but you also have uh, that one right by the water. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Oh, no, the, the political campaigns here at that time when Obama was campaigning, uh, there was this uh, production of, uh, we have lessos, kangas. Um, these are cloths that, wrappers, yeah? Uh -huh. you know, turbans and all kinds of things produced with his name. And it, he, he, he was stimulating creativity <laughs> in, uh, in Africa yeah. in the sense that there was this, his, you know, the Kenyan connection. Right. Kenya in particular was full of relics, uh, trinkets and things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, perhaps we can stop here. Yeah, I think. And if there is, um, see if anyone has any comments or qu immediate questions, yeah, please. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, thank you so much. Your work is beautiful. Um, I'm wondering in terms of colors and a color palette, is there a palette that reminds you most of home or that you feel like certain colors you're most attracted to or comforted by or inspired by even? Um, particular colors. <laughs> I would say um, I love green because green, shades of green have um, a reflection of, I live in the tropics. So um, on the equator actually. Um, so green is a very lovely color, I love it. And red is, uh, is another color. 
Um, oranges, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so there's, there's sort of uh, colors that I love a lot, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering, because like the show is about nourishment, I was wondering like what, what do you do like when you're like or, like in the state of like making and like maybe having to make a lot like to keep yourself nourished as like a maker, but also mm. to keep like making art and not I don't know. Oh, uh, what to do for me? Your yeah, own for oh, oh, I see. Of <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah um, <laughs> as I told you, I have high, great respect for herbal medicines. I, I, I drink avocado leaves sometimes. Um, I'm a vegetarian. Occasionally I have a piece of meat. I, I keep cattle. So, you know, I may have some meat. Uh, but I do respect vegetables. And I do have uh, affinity to it. Because as I told you before, my grandfather was a medicine man. So, it's very easy. When, when we feel a bit sick at home, or for me, I, the very first thing is to find the plant that will mm. help me. Um, then go to the chemist. Because you go to the chemist with the worry in the mind that you're going to get chemical stuff right. that could have a reaction. Whereas here, you're quite sure that, uh, yeah. <laughs> Are there any particular plants that have some uh, qualities that expand the mind? Um, well, <laughs> well, there are very many, but I, I, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose uh, in my domain, yeah. um, I find vegetables are the best <laughs> because <laughs> the well-being of your inside of your right. body. Uh, determines your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Any last comments? These are incredible works and very beautiful, but also very spiritual. And in so many ways, they remind me almost like of a Tonka painting or something. Uh, um, and I'm wondering for you as a meditation when you're rendering them, do you think of uh, specific things while you're in the act of, you know, to sort of channel in, in some ways uh, the, the spiritual zone that you want? And they feel performative too. When I'm looking at them, I feel like as if I could just meditate in front of them or they exude a, a particular spiritual energy, each one different from one another. I'm wondering how you're able to, uh, conjure that. They, mm -hmm. they seem very magical. It's a very interesting question because I, I um, when I uh, go to the work, I know it's almost like having a baby, I suppose, uh, a new thing. And so um, shapes are very important. Um, there's the three things, three shapes that are, I really, really love, that I started off with, um, inspired, inspired by, it's a triangle. The triangle is very, very important because you're playing around with the triangle, you get all kinds of shapes. A, a circle, a triangle, um, a rectangle, uh, makes this amazing figure of a woman. For me, um, the figure of a woman is uh, important because it's sort of like uh, the epitome, is this the right word, of human, of life, uh, you know. So you have uh, those shapes. And so when you're playing around with those shapes um, and you achieve a, a painting, that goes on the side. Um, and then you get another one. Every morning I walk, I wake, and sometimes I like to walk very early morning and walk, think about the work I'm going to do. And that's when sometimes I stumble on a piece of wood, mm. I stumble on something, an idea, 
um, and then I rushed to the studio to try and do something and sketch. And that's how the new ideas come. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting when you were reading the poem uh, to sort of like reflect upon the in line with the dot, the beat that starts each piece. Because when you see the work, you appreciate it. But then I'm starting to think me having to immerse myself in each piece and think, where is that beat that started each of any of those pieces? And also for the artist, and his team thinking, how many beats are gonna make up this piece? And how long is it gonna take us? And I think from my experience, at times when you're around people that see this kind of works, and someone walks into the room, they think, that's beautiful. And then when they draw closer, they think, wow, someone had to actually focus and do all this. You know? So I think it's a level of love and it's, it's, it's a discipline, you know, above everything, yeah. But yeah, the dot, yeah. the beat that starts each piece, yeah. No, so, thanks for that Thank comment. you, um, yeah. It's, uh, Do you I, think about the first beat as well? Um, maybe two. The beads, um, when I was a, ba a, a child, um, the first thing I ever saw was a necklace around my auntie's, you know, neck. Um, she would come from Congo after a while and come to where we lived. And, um, yeah, and hold me and put me on the knee. And, and I was uh, young enough to sort of be happy to be on, sitting on her knee. but. The necklace was so scary. It had big uh, beads, and there were black and white, and there were other beads, you know, because beads are, are so important in our communities. They, uh, and, and, and so uh, beads are very significant to me. They, 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 they have this sort of, uh, one of my children is called Amber because of the amber beads from Somalia that I used to collect. And uh, beads are a sense of value and a sense of uh, um, the beauty of a bead. Uh, I mean, uh, in my beads have got, of course, the messages and, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I love, I had forgotten about the poem I don't know how you came up with the point. <laughs> oh, you, you, you. I'm so happy you did. Yeah. <laughs> because the poem actually puts it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, the education that we normally get in Africa is Western education. The syllabuses have not changed since 50, 60 years. And it does not touch on our own uh, traditional lifestyle that educates us to be who we are, the community education, the stories, the life we went through. So you, are de de you depart from your own to something new. And if you want to become an artist, you have to reflect back. And I think and I hope that the African artists will play a big part in fusing the, 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 the lives of every the universal life. At least we have a lot to talk about. I think we probably appreciate what I'm talking about. But you know, um, we do have a lot to talk about and unknown to very many. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, you mentioned a lot about nature in this conversation. 
Um, I think you also mentioned how nature is the best teacher. Um, could you maybe expand on that a little bit more and how like the role nature has played in your early childhood and all the way up to the works that we see here today? I can give you probably an example um, of um, two examples. As a child, we're playing in the river. We're two, three, four children. Our parents are working away, or, and there's a little river going through a patch of garden. And uh, you throw in leaves, you throw in pieces of wood, and you throw in, um, and you see them moving. And some of them get stuck on the side of the river, of the little river, yeah, the little stream. And then you start to argue about, oh, mine is stuck. Why is it stuck? So you correct. You throw in a piece of heavier material. It doesn't move very much. And you're continually wondering why this is not moving as fast as so-and-so's. You know, it's all to do with the weight and movement and motion and physics. And, and then late, it's when later you become aware the beauty of nature that it can give you. Um, one time I was standing over there looking at the moon. The moon was right above me, and, and my young brother was, I would send him away to stand there and say, where is your moon? <laughs> and he would be pointing ahead over his, uh, his head. And I knew there couldn't be two moons. There's only one moon. And so I would be really <laughs> angry. Uh, how can you see a moon above you when it's on my side? Of, you know, there was that understanding that uh, actually the distance, um, you know, you can't, it's one thing, the moon, you're looking at it. Somebody miles away will also be looking at it above themselves. So nature has this magical way of teaching us things. You see a tree growing with strength in it, and that strength is what the artist will be looking at, and not so much the volume of, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I think, um, thank you, Sana. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.